guys, this is Meredith from the Witty Gritty Paper Co. And today I'm going to answer all of your watercolor questions that you left and um, submitted on my leaf giveaway video. And I am just amazed you guys asked some of the best questions and I'm so excited to answer them. And um, since there were a lot of them, I just wanted to let you know that um, I felt like some of them were sort of repeat questions. So if I don't mention your name um, out loud, it should be in the corner of the video. Check for the corner of the video. Um, for your username so that you know that my answer is directed to you too because I wanted everybody to feel like they got an answer But um, like I said a lot of them were sort of repeats and I just um, Want to make sure that you knew I had gotten your question and I wanted to make sure you had an answer So let's dive right in um, since I got so many questions I've decided to divide this video up into three different categories of questions and the first one is supply questions so let's dive right in. So our first question comes from Andrea Mata, and she asks, have I tried the White Knight watercolors? What do I think of them if I have tried them? So um, actually, I'd never heard of the White Knight watercolors until now, so I Googled it. And what I think that Andrea is talking about is the White Knight's set of watercolors by St. Petersburg. And um, I believe it's a Russian um, company. And I have not tried them before, but I did a little, I did a little um, so researching around, and um, they actually look to be a uh, very good quality. I think they're, I believe they're artist quality, and um, they're a very good price. I think I saw that you could get 24 pans for $24.50, which is a really good deal for artist quality paint. And um, I'll make sure to put links to any of the products that I mentioned specifically in the description if you're looking for that. So, um, so just watch out for those. And um, the reason I think that they're so inexpensive is because sometimes when a foreign art supply company first starts selling its goods in the United States, it doesn't have much of a reputation in this country yet, so you can get the paint really cheaply because established artists won't try it yet, they're a little leery, they don't know if it's good, and so you can get a great deal. Whereas in a couple years from now, um, if it's proven that it's a great paint, it'll be a lot more expensive. So I think that that may be the reason that the paint is such a good deal. So I would say it's probably a pretty calculated risk. I um, I actually am curious to try them myself. So I have not tried White Knight's watercolors, but they look like a very interesting deal to me. So that would be my answer to that. Okay, so the next question is, what are your favorite watercolor paints to use? And um, this comes from Jolie B. My favorite watercolor paints, it's really hard to choose, but my favorites are probably, um, let me grab some. They are Winsor & Newton, right here. My little Winsor & Newton tube colors, or in pans. Um, not the Coatman, but the, um, the Artist Grade Winsor & Newton Professional Watercolor Paints, closely followed by the Daniel Smith um, watercolor paints. These are probably my favorite um, watercolor paints to use. Okay, moving right along. All right, now this is a great question, and this one I think was one of the most repeated ones, um, and it's it's got a lengthy answer, so we'll spend some time on this one. So the question is, as a beginner in watercolor, what kind of supplies should I start off with? For example, what kind of brushes, paper, paint, and palettes um, are affordable? And is there any other thing I can use that'll make my experience easier as a beginner? So this is a great all around um, question that I feel like a lot of people don't get an answer to. So first of all, um, basic supplies. You definitely are gonna want brushes, paper, and paint, obviously. And um, let's start with brushes. You can actually get away with owning only about two watercolor brushes when you're a beginner. I'm fishing mine out here. And those two types of brushes are round brushes and flat brushes. So you can really get along with just buying one round brush and one flat brush when you're a beginner. That's um, gonna serve you well. If you were gonna buy a third brush, I would buy a detail brush like this one. This is my detail brush, or my favorite detail brush. Um, but that's not necessary. If you have a good round brush, it'll give you a nice point and you'll be able to do most of the work you could with this small one. So that would be the first kind of um, brushes you should go for. You should reach for as a beginner are rounds and flats. Um, the next thing, paper. Um, I'm sure you guys know, I've mentioned this before, I don't believe in buying the most expensive paper on the market when you first start out because I think supplies that intimidate you 
are kind of counterintuitive. You know, if you're afraid to use them, then you know, you're just going to save them for special occasions. You're not going to paint as often. You're going to be worried about the money. And I don't want that to be the case. I want you guys to feel confident in using your supplies and experimenting. So I would suggest you get um, not really cheap paper, but a lower quality watercolor paper. But make sure it is still watercolor paper. Don't try painting on cardstock, even if it's thick cardstock. Um, for your paintings, you want real watercolor paper. And um, as far as paint goes, I love pans for beginners. I've got a paint set over here. Um, this is actually made as a travel set, which I've added some colors to. But pan sets, I think, are super great for beginners. They're um, very portable and usually relatively inexpensive. So I would reach for pans if you're um, a first-time painter and if you're a real beginner. Okay, and palettes. Now, I mentioned this too. I personally love to use only ceramic palettes. I'm going to grab one here. And my palettes always seem to be dirty when I show them to you guys. So, so I apologize for that. But I love ceramic for palettes. I do not recommend plastic. You can get plastic. It works. But it stains easier. It yellows. It's hard to clean. So if you're a beginner, ceramic is not very expensive. And you don't even have to get a mixing dish like this. You can honestly just use a ceramic plate if you have one or buy one at Goodwill. So um, if you're a beginner, try to find a ceramic dish to mix on. I think that that will make your life easier, especially when you're cleaning them out. And then is there any other thing that you can use to make your experience easier? Yes. Um, when you're a beginner, there is one thing that I feel like isn't um, publicized enough, and that is masking tape. Um, and specifically high adhesive masking tape. Now I have seen artists, and um, I have myself, use colored masking tape and blue painters tape and other types of masking tape, but this is the one that I find is the best for watercolors and it is like I said high adhesive masking tape it is sometimes called contractors tape too and I buy it at the hardware store and I realize there's not much on this roll for you to see right now I'm sorry about that but um I think that this is great as a beginner it um let's see it not only keeps your paper flat as it dries because you've strapped it down with this tape but it also gives you a nice clean border around your paintings, which can be very hard to judge when you're a beginner. So this is sort of like a little cheat sheet for a clean white border. So if you're a beginner, I would say that this will help you out a lot if you're not painting on blocks, obviously. And I think that um, buying paper in pads is cheaper. So this can, you know, this is, I believe, $2.50. So this is a great way to paint with paper that comes from pads um, and still get the block sort of feel with the clean edges and everything. So that would be my little special tool that I would say um, will make your experience much easier as a beginner. Okay, um, next question. What is your favorite watercolor paper? And this comes from Blue Butterfly. Um, okay, so my favorite watercolor paper has got to be 300 pound Fabriano uh, cold press watercolor paper and I love it. It is super thick. You don't even have to mask it down. It's so thick and um, I love its deckle edges and the cotton surface. It's it's definitely my favorite. I don't use it all the time. I don't usually use it for videos, but it is my um, probably my favorite paper when I'm doing really um, What do I want to say? What is the word I'm looking for here? Really? intensive paintings. Like when I'm doing a complicated painting or a huge painting, those are the ones that I really want to break out my 300 pound paper because it can stand up to a lot of abuse. So that's probably my favorite paper, although it is not my most used paper. Okay, next one. I love this question. It comes from Ash Lauren. If someone has limited money to spend on supplies, which tool or tools are the most important to splurge on? Which ones make the most difference in your watercolor? This is a great question. Um, I would say that most watercolor artists are going to tell you that you should splurge on paper. You should buy the best paper that you can afford, and, you know, that's the be-all and all of that. You, you know, you guys probably can um, feel this one coming, but I disagree. I, I feel that paper is not the place to splurge on, at least not when you're a beginner. Um, the next thing that I feel like is a common um, answer would be paint. And this is probably going to surprise you, but... Paint is probably the area where you can cheap out on the most, believe it or not. Um, the only thing you really don't want to do is don't go crazy cheap. Don't buy the set of 24 
little um, round ones you can get at like the big box stores that are all chalky for, you know, $5. Don't buy those. Those are hardly even watercolors. They're so chalky. But you can buy cheaper uh, paint, student grade paint. Um, like the Winsor Newton Cotman line or Coatman is a very, um, a very good beginner line. And um, as well as the Turner line of paints, that's pretty good. I believe you can get Oh geez, a set of 18 for 30, 20 or 30 dollars, I forget. But um, and that might sound like a, a lot, but it's it's really not in the spectrum of artist grade watercolors. So you don't really have to splurge on paint. You can do well with cheaper paints. Um, like I said, just make sure you don't don't go crazy cheap. But you can get away with like a $20 or $30 set and it'll still work great for you. My answer to the splurge question is brushes. Oh my gosh, I love brushes. And they, um, in my opinion, make the biggest difference in my watercolor. I actually own some brushes that gasp <laughs> are like $40. They're, um, I own a lot of nicer brushes. And the reason is I feel that brushes, this is one of my newest brushes, I feel that brushes are an investment piece. You know, they don't wear out easily if you get nice ones and they can make all the difference in the things you're able to do in your paintings. I mean, this almost looks like a makeup brush, but it, it's a mop brush. It performs so beautifully. I, I love it. And my one of my pet peeves in watercolor is shedding brushes. I hate when bristles come out. And if you invest in really good brushes, that will never happen. Their bristles will stay in there and they will serve you for definitely for months, possibly for years and years. I don't think I've ever thrown out a brush. I'm pretty sure that even when my brushes wear out a little, I still keep them to do other techniques because they're still good. Um, and uh, you know, they're my splurge item. I love to spend money on brushes. I've got probably too many of them. Um, but that would be my answer to that. Brushes are going to last you much longer than paints or paper. You're always going to be going through paints and paper. So if you're a beginner, do not splurge on paints or paper, in my opinion, buy brushes. You know, they're, they're going to be your best friends in this painting adventure. And um, if you buy good brushes, make sure you take care of them. So that's, that's an extra little thing. Make sure you take care of your good brushes. Get a nice box for them and don't shut them up in airtight containers when they're still wet because watercolor brushes, they take a long time to dry. So keep that in mind too with your nicer brushes. Okay, so on that note of brushes, what are my favorite affordable watercolor brushes? Okay, and this comes from Angel Bailey too. I would say the Princeton Art Neptune series is the series that I um, reach for the most. They're my favorite brushes. I believe I've got three or four right around here somewhere. These two are Princeton Art Neptunes. Um, and they aren't exactly, I don't really want to call them cheap or affordable because they aren't exactly that way. They're, they can still be pricey. They can still be five to $10 a piece, depending on which brush you're buying. But if you really, if you're only buying two brushes, that doesn't end up being a lot of money. So, I mean, that's really up to you. I feel like everybody has a different opinion on what affordable is, you know, it's a perspective thing. So, um, that's my favorite I would say higher end, but still not crazy expensive brush. Um, some other good, really, um, not really cheap, but more affordable brushes. I believe the Royal Aqualon, I believe that's what they're called. Those are really good. I believe you can get a set of seven for like $20, which is a great deal on nicer brushes and they have acrylic handles. So if you leave them in your water, they won't, um, they won't rot cause they're acrylic. So that would be a good brand for you to check out. I'll have a link to that too. And let's see, um, if you're going to go to the big box store and look for brushes, my, um, my only, my only rule here is if you want to get the most affordable brushes, you want to go into the store, just don't buy the brushes that say that they work for watercolors, acrylics, and oils, okay? If any brush tells you it works great for all three, it is lying to you. Throw it back in the display, it's lying to you. Watercolors, acrylics, and oils are very different mediums. They require different things in a brush to get the best performance. So just please don't buy those brushes that say they can do everything. They cannot. <laughs> and they usually shed. So um, no matter what cheaper brushes you want to get, just make sure that they are made specifically exclusively for watercolor. So that can be a, um, a huge problem if, if you don't look at that carefully. 
Okay, let's see. Have I ever used liquid watercolors? If so, what are the advantages of the liquid over cakes or tubes? And this comes from Jill Jackson. Um, I have used liquid watercolors. I actually own quite a few of them. And if you've never heard of liquid watercolors before, they can also be called watercolor concentrate. Um, they come in these little bottles like this. Um, very cute, usually with eyedroppers on the top. And um, the advantages of them is they are, they are very, very vibrant. That's actually part of the reason they come with an eyedropper. You don't use them in the same way you use cakes and tubes. You don't go straight from them. Um, you drop out a little bit with the eyedropper and you dilute that with water and then use that on your painting. I, there are some instances where you might want to use it straight, but very rarely because they are very concentrated. Think of it like concentrated juice. You have to cut it with water um, or it just doesn't work very well. It's just all too much. So um, I love them. I have used them. I, I own a lot of them, like I said. And I would say the advantages of them are, like I said, just vibrancy. You, you're always going to be very vibrant um, and very bold in your paintings. Now, I would say, though, if you if you paint mostly organic things like plants or flowers or animals, um, these probably aren't your best investment because th because they're so vibrant, um, they almost make things look inorganic. They make them look not natural. So I would say that, you know, they have huge advantages, but it really depends on what you paint. So well, just think about that carefully before you invest in them. If you, uh, if you paint... Um, more man-made subjects or abstracts, then they are awesome. Go for it. But um, since most most uh, natural scenes, you know, they, you want colors that are earthier and muddier and that kind of thing, they, they can kind of ruin an organic look. So they're good and bad. It, it really depends on what you paint, whether or not they're going to be good for you. And um, let's see, the related question is from... Oh, forgive me if I pronounce any of your names wrong. Just so you know, I'm very sorry. I'm trying, I'm going to try my best, um, but take my apologies here in advance. Um, but our next question comes from Dezifa Donso, and she asks, what's the difference between tube watercolors and pan watercolors? And do they show a visual difference? Um, I would say that no, they do not show a visual difference. See, I'll pull out some of my sample sheets here. Here are some sample sheets, and I've got both pan watercolors and tube watercolors shown on these sheets and both of them um, you know look very similar to me I do not think even the most practice of artists could tell me which came from which so in my opinion no they don't show a visual difference visually they are equal however um, when you're painting with them pans are more um, liable to get dirty. Some artists don't like pans because they feel like they mix into each other and they muddy up. And if you're careful, that doesn't happen. But I can see, I can see why they think that. Um, but I personally love pans. I love tubes too, but I love pans because they're portable. And um, I find that you don't use up too much color. Like since it's a solid little brick of color in a pan, you just, it's hard to use up too much. It's hard to waste it. So I love them for that reason. And um, tube watercolors, are basically only different in that they come wet. So if you're an artist, and there are some artists that only like to work wet, if you're an artist that you find you like to work right from the tube, you like a lot of color, then that might be a better choice for you. I personally use all three. I use liquid watercolors, I use pans, and I use tubes. I find them quite interchangeable, and I love them all. So, um, so that's really a personal choice for you. You do not, definitely do not have to have all three, but that's just, that's what I do. And particularly pans and tubes are the most comparable. The liquid watercolor is a little bit more in a category of their own. So I hope that helps. Um, let's see. Just want to go down my list here, make sure I'm getting all the questions. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm talking like a mile a minute here. I want to make sure this video isn't too crazy long and that everybody gets their question answered here. Okay. All right. Um, what brand of masking fluid do you prefer? I haven't done that one yet. Um, this comes from Doreen Marchetti. I use the Winsor & Newton Art Masking Fluid, and it's specially made for watercolor. And I think that that's important. Um, but I, to be honest with you, I haven't used too many different types of masking fluid because I've always been happy with this. I've had this bottle probably for a year now, and look how much is left in it. So I don't use masking fluid on every one of my paintings, but I do use it often enough. So this is my favorite. 
Um, and it's not too expensive, but it's also not cheap. It's, you know, it's pretty comparable. I know that um, you can buy tinted masking fluid. It either comes, I think, blue or pink or that kind of thing. Um, but I personally don't like tinted. I, I find that it almost throws off my eye. So when I'm mixing a color, it, it ends up looking kind of weird and wrong. So I personally am fine with this sort of off-white color that it comes in. I, I can always see it fine. But um, there is tinted available if you find that you have that problem with masking fluid. Um, so that's my favorite brand. And let's see, I have another question here about masking fluid. Um, let's see. Okay, do, do you have any tips for using masking fluid with watercolors? And this comes from Alyssa Gregory. So this is a great question too, and I'm actually going to do a whole big video on the best ways to use masking fluid because I think that it can be a minefield if you don't know much about it. You can make a lot of mistakes. So I'll just give you a quick couple tips here in this video and um, remember that I'm gonna have a whole video coming soon. So stay tuned for that. But my quick tips would be, first of all, never use your good brushes with um, masking fluid. It will ruin your good brushes. It'll get sticky, gunky, it'll get all up in there. You wanna use your cheap brushes when you use this. The second tip is that it smells pretty bad. So you might wanna work in a ventilated area. So um, I don't mind if I use it inside because I don't use that much of it, but you know, some people are more sensitive than others. So just keep that in mind. And um, the last thing I'll tell you is that sometimes when you pull masking fluid off of your paper and you have a sketch underneath your masking fluid, sometimes it will pull some of that sketch lead off of the paper and um, it can actually lighten your sketch or if you sketch really lightly, it can take away your sketch. So keep that in mind when you are sketching and you know you're gonna be using masking fluid, it will oftentimes pick up some of the lead when you take it off. So those would be my quick tips for masking fluid. All right, I've got one last question here and I um, for supplies. And I love this question. It comes from Deborah Bronson and she asks, how do I choose paint colors to make a basic versatile palette? There are so many choices. Oh, this is such a good question. I wish I had had somebody to answer it for me when I was a beginner. Um, first of all, you're absolutely right, Deborah. There are so many choices. I believe Daniel Smith makes 258 colors alone and that's just one brand. So um, my suggestion would be that when you're building a basic palette, you want to have two blues one red, one pink, one orange, two greens, one gray, two browns, and a yellow. And um, make sure you rewind. You can hear me say that again. I realize I went through it pretty fast. Um, and I feel weird giving you a specific list of colors because I feel like everybody really has their own sort of um, perfect combination, like secret magic recipe that works for their paintings, for their style. So I will, I will tell you the 12 colors that fall into that category that I use the most. Um, but don't feel like you have to stick to them exactly. Like I said, it, as long as you follow the, um, the number suggestions that I just said, you'll probably be okay. So the colors that I would say, the 12 that I would pick if I was building um, a very bare bones basic palette for myself would be ultramarine blue, cerulean blue, sap green, hooker's green, um, Payne's gray, alizarin crimson, Permanent Rose, Burnt Sienna, Burnt Umber, Indian Yellow, Nicolazo Yellow, and Windsor Orange Red Shade. Now, I don't know if they make this, this is a um, Windsor Newton color, this Windsor Orange, so they probably don't make the exact same thing in other brands, but you can probably find something very comparable. Um, so definitely do, do whatever you want for building the palette. Rely on colors that you know you like, but like I said, I think as long as you have this sort of basic um, framework, then your palette is going to work just great for you. So I hope that helps, um, Deborah, because that's a that's a great question. All right, guys, that's it for the supply questions. Now we're going to move on to questions about paint theory. Okay, guys, now I want to move on to the paint theory questions. And just before I do that, I just want to apologize if this is like way too long for some of you. Um, you know, I just want to make sure everybody got their question answered. And I'm not going to worry about too much. I mean, we got some time to chat. So that's kind of nice. Okay, so my first paint theory question here is um, from Robert Peterson. And he asks, I know you can't really paint a picture of a metallic object without a metallic paint but are there ways to give an impression of a small amount like the bell on a cat's collar? That is such a great question. Um, well, first of all, I think you definitely can paint acrylic, or not acrylic, I'm sorry, paint metallic objects without metallic paint. Um, actually, metallic paints can be relatively 
hard to find. So um, I did a little demonstration here and I already did. I decided not to do it on camera. And I've got three little bells here because that's the example Robert uses. Um, this one I drew, this one I just sketched out. This one I did in paint, um, just, you know, purple watercolor paint. And then this one I did in um, pearlescent watercolor. So I'm hoping that, I'm turning in here, I'm hoping you guys are able to see the shininess of it. So I would say that um, if you want to do a metallic object without metallic paint, you can, or you should, first of all, you should study the values of your object, like doing a sketch of it, looking it up, and or just doing it with paint. Like I've made this bell look shiny purely by painting it strategically. Can you guys see that? Let me see if I can zoom in here. Okay, so I've made this look shiny just by strategically painting light and dark. So that's an option for you if you don't have metallic paint. You could take a brown or a yellow and paint it like this to give the impression, or you know, a copper, a bronze, whatever, whatever color the bell is, or the metallic object. Um, and drawing it actually helps to define those values. So if you want to draw it first, that's fine too. And the pearlescent watercolors, they are very um, inexpensive, at least the set I have is very inexpensive. Um, I know Daniel Smith also makes a line of luminescent ones, so I'm sure you could get expensive ones, but they're pretty cheap, and um, they are not as shiny as real metallic paint, but they are pretty nice and they give um, a good sheen. And if you're if you're looking to invest in a metallic set of watercolors, if you do ever decide to buy some metallic paint, I highly recommend the Fine Tech watercolor um, gold watercolor palette. It's really cool, not very expensive for all the stuff you get, and it's great paint. So um, I hope that answers I hope that answers that question. Okay, moving right along. Um, this one comes from Bushcraft on Fire, and the question is, do you do plain air painting? And if so, could you do a few videos? I do plain air paint, I love to plain air paint, and I will definitely do some videos, so stay tuned for that. Okay, the next question um, is, it was actually asked a couple of times, so like the supply section of the video, I'm gonna lump it together. The question was basically, um, what is the white watercolor paint used for? I always heard that the page is supposed to be used as the white in paintings. Um, this is also a great question. Let me zoom out again. My hands are probably looking all freakishly huge. Okay. <laughs> Back to normal. Anyway, um, the white paint um, is a little controversial because traditional watercolorists, very traditional ones, watercolor purists, will always tell you that the only white you should use in your watercolor paintings is the white of the paper. That if you want white, you should preserve it from the beginning. Now, this is not what I do. If you've watched some of my videos, um, you've probably seen me pull out my white calligraphers ink, um, or occasionally white watercolor like um, titanium white or Chinese white. And um, like I said, it's a little controversial. A lot of artists don't like to use it. A lot of them love it. So I would definitely suggest that if you're on the edge, you should try it for yourself. But um, I think the confusion here is why, um, why it has an advantage, basically. So I thought I'd pull out some real life examples to show you that. The reason I use white watercolors is because there are certain paintings that I feel would not be possible um, to try to mask off or paint around. So like if you look at these little smaller paintings I've got here, I've got, um, they're pretty abstract. I just did them for fun. And they've got um, obviously a pink color scheme and a blue color scheme. And they're these little shapes and they've got tiny little patterns on them like stripes and um, triangles, dots, squiggles, that sort of thing. Can you guys see that? I might zoom in again. Is that clear? Okay. I hope so. Anyway, so these white details would not have been possible, really, most of them. Some of them may be like this white dot, but as a general rule, it just would have been completely impractical for me to try to paint around these areas. And it would have been just ridiculously time intensive for me to mask them off, first of all. I mean, this allowed me to change my mind as I went. And, you know, it was just much, much easier. So I don't want to say that it's like the um, sort of cheaty way to do it. Um, that's not a word, but you know, I, I don't want to say that it's cheating. I like to think of it as the efficient way out. Sometimes there are some paintings that just wouldn't be possible if you only had the white of the paper as your white. So, you know, it's up to you. And here's actually another painting I did. 
um, that has um, quite a bit of both, actually. The white that you see here in this foreground and a little bit up in these slopes was all preserved white. This is the white of the paper that you're seeing here. However, the rooftops and the snow on the branches of the trees, as well as the very tips of these snowbanks, um, I added some of my calligrapher's ink, my white watercolor. And um, the reason is the same as the other painting. It just would have been crazy for me to try to preserve these spaces, especially because I've got this huge wash in the back with the sky. Um, and obviously it was very wet. You can see evidence of that. So, you know, I mean, I use the white watercolor because sometimes it just gives an effect I would otherwise not be able to achieve, or it would just be ridiculously um, time consuming to achieve the same thing. And I am, I don't consider myself a watercolor purist. I consider myself a watercolor enthusiast. So I love whatever, um, ends up looking good in the end. So it's completely up to you. Whatever you like, um, is fine. I, I encourage you to form your own opinion about this. So I use the white watercolor just to add details. I try not to use it, you know, for any big spaces, I try to use it sparingly. So you know, make up your own mind about whether or not you like it. Um, and don't be bogged down by any artist that tells you it's, you know, against the rules. I mean, there aren't rules. It's art. There can't be rules. So, so just decide for yourself. I don't want you to worry too much about, about what other people have told you. Just decide for you what's best for you. Okay. The next question is a great, great question. It comes from Linda Molinard. And she asks, I don't understand glazing techniques. I'm fairly new and many tutorials say I'm adding some glazing here, but what is it and what does it do for my project? Most importantly, how do you do it? So this is one of those classic watercolor terminology misunderstandings. Nobody actually explains it to you, but everybody uses the terminology. So it can be very confusing and frustrating. So I actually made up a, another little, um, a little diagram for us here. I should maybe just stay zoomed in for this part of the video. And um, I wanted to demonstrate the differences in some watercolor terminology. You'll hear in a lot of tutorials, people talking about how they're adding a wash. So this on the left here, this blue um, rectangle is a flat wash. It's one color evenly dispersed um, across the paper. So if you hear somebody say, I'm adding a wash, this is what they're doing. They're adding a layer of color. And usually what they'll do is they'll wet the whole area that they're gonna paint, and then they'll drop pigment into it evenly and then you want to leave these alone. If you get fussy with a flat wash, um, it'll backfire on you. So a wash is a basic concept, and um, but, it, but it is different than glazing. So glazing, we've got glazing on the right here. Glazing basically just means adding a layer of color on top of another dry layer of color. So right now, I've got this band of blue going behind these three colors that I painted on top. And basically, the point of glazing is to change the layer underneath. So um, if I painted a layer of blue and I wanted to change the way the blue looked, I could paint either this yellowish color or this reddish color on top of it to get these colors in the middle. So these colors in the middle are the objective of glazing. The artist is trying to change the layer underneath by adding, by glazing another layer um, over the top of the first layer. So um, the only thing to remember with glazing um, that's important is that you make sure you pick colors that aren't staining colors like stay away from um, phthalo greens and blues because those are very staining colors because um, if you use a staining color on top for glazing you really won't be able to see the color in, underneath so make sure you use um, non-staining transparent watercolors when you glaze so I hope that clears that up it's a really simple thing but it never gets explained I think it's almost too simple that nobody ever explains it so it actually ends up being kind of hard so I'm glad that was a question that was asked here. Okay, next one. Actually, I had two here that were very similar. And basically, they were questions about um, why I use my sample sheets. Like, why I use my paint swatches. What's the point of them? And I'm going to zoom out a little again. And um, the, reason, the reason I use a paint swatch, first of all, is... Um, to make sure I know what every color I have looks like. So here's one of my bigger paint swatches here. And I've actually got a sheet of tracing paper over it with all the names of the colors and that kind of thing. But um, this is the main, you know, the meat of my sample sheet here. 
And basically, I like to swatch out every color I have so that when I go to do a painting, especially if I'm trying to match a color from a photo or from real life, I can see if I already own something that's really close to it or exactly it. And if I don't, then comes sort of the second, um, what do I want to say, player in my sample sheet. I mix colors. I try to mix a color that's similar, and then I bring out this sample sheet, which again, you've undoubtedly seen me use if you see my other videos. I bring out this strip of paper, and I paint it on there, and I check. Before I put it on the painting, I check, and I keep swatching until I get the color I want. So, you know, I, I use them, I call both of these sample sheets, uh, but technically they, they serve different purposes. These I make when I get new colors, and these I pretty much have one for every painting I do. So, um you know, it helps me decide which colors to use. And this is especially important when you are working on a particular painting. So these are really more for mixing colors, these smaller sample sheets. And these are for making sure I always know which colors I already have. So I hope that helps with the sample sheet questions. Um, yeah, I, I feel like I don't see sample sheets from other artists as much, but I love them. So that's why I use them. Okay, the next question comes from Nicole Kui, and she asks, um, let's see, let me read here. Da, 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 da. She asks, what do you think are good beginner watercolor projects? And she also asks if I have any tips on how to letter with watercolors. So these are great questions. Um, first of all, when you're a beginner, I would say that you're probably going to be overwhelmed with three pretty specific different subject matter for watercolor. There are landscapes, um, flowers and plants, and um, abstract. So other, those are probably the three most dominated subjects, probably in watercolor in general, but especially if you're a beginner. And if you're a beginner trying to decide what to paint, I am 100% recommending landscapes. They're very easy. They teach you a ton about layering, and they may not seem easy, but that's sort of what's cool about them. They look like such great finished paintings, but they're actually pretty easy to do and you learn so much. So I am recommending landscapes. And actually I'm gonna do something kind of scary for me here. I, I actually went and I dug out the very first painting I ever did in watercolors. And it's a landscape um, of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And um, I just, I wanted to point out this, the first thing I, this is the first thing I ever painted and it turned out kind of okay. Um, I, I think, <laughs> I like to think. So I think that this just proves that landscapes are a really good place to start if you're a beginner. So um, that's what I would recommend for subject matter. And when you're picking a subject and you're a beginner, um, try, try not to get overwhelmed by a subject. Like if you see a flower on the ground, you can, it's fine to, ju to just try to paint the flower. Like you don't have to paint, um, man, I'm getting tongue tied. Sorry. You don't have to paint the grass around it or the leaves or, you know, the bug on it. You can just paint the flower. That's okay. Don't feel overwhelmed by having to paint a whole scene. You can paint a single object. I think it's a good way to start out. So when you're picking subject matter, try to break it down into pieces. Now, if you paint the flower and then decide you want to add the grassy background, then that's great. But you know, then you, you didn't have that pressure. So, um, I would say keep that in mind when you're choosing subject matter. And as far as lettering goes with watercolors, um, I would say if you want to letter, you're going to need a really good round brush or a quill brush. Um, that's going to help out a lot. Or if you want, um, this is sort of a cheat sheet move. If you want to do a really good cheat sheet watercolor lettering, then buy yourself a water-based marker. Now I used a dark blue Tombow for what I did here, and I actually just drew I'm going to, I keep having to zoom in. Um, I just drew out, uh, these words and then I took a brush with just water, a watercolor brush with just water in it. And I went over the ink and it activated almost like watercolor pencils and watercolor markers do, but it's just a water-based marker. It's not a watercolor marker. It is a water-based marker and there is a difference. So like I said, I used a Tombow. So that's the brand, but any water-based work, uh, marker will do. Um, I know Spectrum Aquas are good. And this is just a really easy cheat sheet. So technically not watercolor lettering, but it looks just like watercolor lettering and you have a lot of control. So um, you don't have to do this, but I just thought I'd share that this works really well, the water-based marker technique. Okay guys, and the last question for paint theory was, do I have any watercolor techniques or textures for effects? 
Um, I have a whole video coming up soon that's going to be all about watercolor effects, special effects, but some quick ones off the top of my head are salt, um, bleach, and let me try to think of one more. <sighs> mm, saran wrap. So those are three really quick techniques, and I'm going to do a whole video about that. So if you want to see it in more detail, just wait for that to come out, and um, it will be golden. So uh, I can't really go into depth right now, but there are a lot of special techniques that are out there. So we're going to go over those all soon in a video coming up. All right, now onto our last question segment, troubleshooting questions. And if you're still here, if you're still watching, thank you so much. I really just wanted to answer everybody's questions. And I know it got to be like a ridiculously long video, but I think it's kind of fun. Like I said, we're having like a paint chat together. So we get to bond. So that's always good. All right, so on to the last questions here. Okay, our first troubleshooting question comes from actually a friend of mine, Clover and Dot, and she asks, what would be a good brand of pen to paint over with watercolor? I have microns, but they smudge with water. Okay, so this actually really puzzled me because microns, if you've never heard of them, they are drawing ink markers. Um, microns are made with waterproof archival ink. So I was very surprised to hear that they didn't work well. And actually, I can't tell you why they didn't because I, I went and did my own little experiment. I've done pen and ink with watercolors before, but not recently. So I went and did my own little experiment. And this is, this is what I did. And um, on the left here, I drew with microns. I drew a picture of a flower and then I painted over it. And then on the right, I painted a swatch of color and then I drew over that. So this is basically um, an opposite of each other. And clearly, you, can, you guys can see that it didn't, it didn't smudge. So I don't know what, I feel very perplexed now. I'm not sure why they're smudging for Kate um, from Clover and Dot, because like I said, you know, that they, they worked for me and they've always worked for me. But all I would say is maybe you got a bad batch or they're old or dried out. I, I have no idea. Maybe your watercolors are reacting badly. So I, I really, I'm sorry, I can't tell you why they're smudging because they work, you know, they work okay for me here. They worked fine for me. Um, but all I would say is that when you're picking markers to use with watercolors, either under or on top of, just make sure that you pick watercolors that do, or not watercolors, sorry, that you pick markers that do not have a water base. Because if they are based with water, they will react to water. Like, um, like the lettering example I just showed um, for Nicole, who had the question about lettering, the blue letters like that. That was a water-based marker, so it reacted with water, and that's why that worked. But this works because it's not a water-based marker. Um, so just keep that in mind. Like, alcohol-based markers should work fine. So I'm sorry I can't give a better answer than that. It's, it's kind of frustrating. It's weird. Um, but well, like I said, they worked okay for me, so I wanted to make sure. I didn't want to just, you know, just answer. I want to make sure I experimented. So I'm sorry about that, but I, I, hope, um, I hope, like, in the future they'll work. You can give it another shot. Um, and hopefully it'll work. Okay, the next question comes from Danielle E. And she asks, how do I keep my paper from buckling? It's so frustrating, frustrating and it keeps happening. Okay, this is a huge problem and I can totally relate. It is very common. And um, I would say there could be a couple culprits here. First of all, um, even with the highest quality paper, when you put a ton of water on it, it's gonna buckle. Even with the very highest quality money can buy, it's still gonna buckle because paper buckles under the um, stress of all the moisture you're putting on it. So the more water you use, the more likely your paper's gonna buckle on you. Um, the thing you can do to help this is mask down your paper always with high adhesive masking tape, um, if you're not already doing that or you can stretch your watercolor paper. Now, personally, I don't stretch my paper hardly ever, um, but you know, a lot of artists love it, a lot of artists swear by it, so you can try stretching your watercolor paper, and I'll have a video on that coming up too. I got a ton of videos in the queue here for you guys. Your questions have sparked some very good ideas, um, so I would keep that in mind, but Mainly, just make sure that you have it masked down and try not to use too much water. And lower quality papers are going to buckle more than higher quality papers. Like I said, even higher quality ones will buckle with enough water, but lower quality ones will buckle 
easier. So that's a that's a big problem. But keep in mind that if your paper buckles when it's wet, it will, if you've um, taped it down, it will dry almost 100% flat. So if you've got this super buckly, you know, ripply piece of paper, I want you to leave it alone until it dries 100%. It will probably dry flatter than you imagine. So um, just make sure that they're taped down and that you can stand to leave it alone. It's not ruined. Um, if it's wet and wavy, it might dry 100% flat. Mine have always dried out much flatter than I may have thought they would when they were wet. So keep that in mind. Okay, next question comes from Jennifer Hammond, and she asks, just to be safe, should people keep watercolor painting out of the sun due to fading? I'm scared even if my painting will fade, even though some paints say it's okay. What are your thoughts on this? Okay, well, this can be a huge problem with watercolors, and the right term for it is light fastness. Um, each watercolor, not just brand, but each individual color will have a light fast rating if you are buying an artist quality, or I think even most student quality paints show a light fast rating on the side. Um, so look on the side of your tube and you should find a light fast rating. Now, the lower the light fast rating, the more likely the color is to fade. The higher it is, the more resistant it is to fading. So um, if you're doing a painting that you know you're gonna hang up, you know you wanna keep it for a long time, try to keep that in mind when you're picking colors. Pick colors that have high light fast ratings. And that's going to help you out a ton. Now, I'm just going to say, personal disclaimer, I've never had a painting significantly fade on me. And I've been painting for a long time. So, you know, I really wouldn't... Don't freak out about that. That's, you know, that's really not an effective thing to freak out about. Some paints will fade a lot, but most most won't. Just if you're really concerned, check the light fast ratings. And um, one color I know is particularly... Um, has a particularly low light fast rating is Opera Rose. So, you know, just keep keep um, your color choice in mind and you should be okay. And you know, if you have it behind glass and even in indirect sunlight, that's much better than direct sunlight. So um, some paintings will fade or almost all paintings will fade ev um, at least a little, even with high quality paints. So it's kind of, you know, comes with the territory, but most of the time it's really not a big problem. You know, just a little bit of preparation can save your paintings and preserve them for a very long time. So I really wouldn't freak out about that. Okay, next question comes from Eliana Lee, and she asks, um, or Eliana Lee, whichever it is, I'm sorry if I'm, so, you know, failing miserably here, but I'm going to say, I'm going to say Eliana Lee. Um, she asks, how can I prevent my watercolor from curling as it dries? Is it that my paper is low quality or am I using too much water? Okay, um, well, I've personally not had many watercolor papers curl up on me as they dry because I always mask them down with my high adhesive masking tape. That's important to me and I always make sure to do it. So um, if it's curling when it dries, like I said, for the buckling, just make sure you keep it, you know tape down until it's 100% dry and it will probably dry pretty flat and you know how much paper you're or not paper sorry how much water and paint you're using will affect that too if you get it really wet it's going to want to curl and buckle even more on you so um I would say that's mainly a, a tack problem make sure you're working on a block or you've taped your paper down okay uh next question um, comes from Cian Holmes, and the question is, how do you prevent watermarks? I don't oversaturate the paper with paint, but I still get a dark ring of color when it's dried. Okay, this is a great question. Um, this is, I think, a huge hurdle for beginners to get over, and I think the problem, I think I understand the problem. I want to, uh, I might be wrong here, but I'm pretty sure that um, what Cian is talking about is um, a pigment load issue. So I've made another diagram here. I'm going to zoom in. And on the right, I have a circle that I painted. And this was with very controlled pigment load. I mixed my paint really, really well. And I, um, as I finished the shape, I watched to see if I had any puddles, if I had any areas that were drying faster than other areas, or any, you know, like I said, puddles, drips of color, and, um, and I removed those as I saw them. So this is actually um, a very even wash. This is, I think, what's ideal. Now on the left here, what I have is an example of color ringing around the edges and some blooms here. Now this happens when, um, it actually can happen for a couple of reasons, but um, one of the reasons is not mixing your color thoroughly enough. When you're 
colors in the dish. You want to mix it like there's no tomorrow. Uh, make sure the water and the pigment are in harmony with each other and really blended. So that's the first thing. The second thing is um, these blooms come from when one area of paint is wetter and the one right next to it is drier. And so they bloom up and they almost look like cauliflower. So, um, you know, that's, that's a drying issue. So if you want to get a flat wash like this, you have to make sure that you pay attention to how even your wash is. So this is a particularly uh, important when you only have one layer. So this would be wrong and this would be right um, as far as pigment load goes. And, you know, it's really a touch thing. Like the more experience you get, the better you get at pigment load, I have found. I, I used to be very bad at it. I used to have blooms all over everything. And, you know, with experience, that went away. All right, and our very last question here comes from Sam. And she asks, do you think that the sizes of the brushes matter on the details? Okay, so, and... All right, so I'm, like, I'm reading everybody's questions here from a distance, so I just wanna make sure I have the whole question. Um, so she's basically asking if I think you can get the same level of detail with a bigger brush. Uh, here's what I think. I think that if you wanna get better as an artist, you should use the highest um, size brush that you can handle, the biggest brush that you can handle. However, um, for tiny details, I always use my detail brush. I try not to, um, I try to, <sighs> I don't know. I don't use my big round brushes for little details just because it's never worked out well for me. So I think that if you're gonna, um, if you're gonna do a lot of detailed paintings and you've only got a round brush, um, like an eight or a 10 or something like a medium sized brush, then you might want to invest in a detail brush. Detail brushes are great. I love them. I use mine on almost every single painting. And, um, I think that it can really help uh, make your details pop. So my answer to that would be yes, I do think that um, the sizes of brushes matter on details. So try to use, a, you know, bigger brushes are great and they help you not be fussy, um, but a detail brushes are important if you wanna get really small details, if you wanna have control over details. That's really what it comes down to is the control. So, um, that's all the questions. Okay, guys. Well, I want to thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for asking these questions and for being interested in my advice and for still sticking around despite the fact that this is now a crazy long video. Um, and if you are brand new to the channel and you made it through this long video, um, I've got tons more advice and other videos and a lot more coming up. So again, guys, thank you so much for watching. If, if this has been a help to you, um, please like and subscribe. And I just thank you so much for watching. Bye.